uh, every one of us, we are so blessed, aren't we? And we uh, see God at work in not only in what he did to die for us and rise again, but how he lives in our lives and we're excited about what God does in our future. I, I know we have something to look forward to. I, this afternoon from 2 to 4, I know a proud grandmother that's looking forward to, to her granddaughter, Brecca, uh, having a bridal shower here. She and her fiancé, Wesley, are going to uh, be having a, a shower here, and uh, we'll be getting married. And we're, I know that uh, Martine is excited about that, as we all are. Hope <clears throat> motivates us to keep going and not give up. Without hope, we don't want to do anything. So I saw this, or heard about this Peanuts cartoon. Lucy and Linus, you know who they were, right, Charlie Brown? Lucy and Linus were sitting in front of the television set when Lucy said to Linus, go get me a glass of water. And Linus looked surprised. Why should I do anything for you? You never do anything for me. Lucy said, Linus, on your 75th birthday, I promise, I'll bake you a cake. So Linus got up and he headed for the kitchen. And on the way he said, life is more pleasant when you have something to look forward to. <laughs> Do you have a hope in God, a, an unshakable, steadfast hope because of Jesus crying out, it is finished because of what, is, what Jesus did for you? Hope not only opens the door to receive a touch from God, Hope is what moves us through the door. Like Linus, when you have hope, you're willing to get up and do something on the most glorious day in the history of the world. Our Savior did something. He rose from the dead. There's never been an event more powerful. There have been people in recent years, we've read their stories, who have died and come back to life. They died on an operating table, the surgeons shot their heart back into rhythm, or somehow they were, were resuscitated and they were gone for a few minutes. But no one has ever died, been dead for more than 24 hours, then brought life back into their own lifeless body and lived again. No one has ever done that except for Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is different than any other event. The resurrection proves something, something very powerful. It proves that Jesus Christ has authority over death and life. It proves that Jesus has authority over heaven and hell. And it proves that we have something to look forward to in our future. If Jesus rose from the dead, then all of his words must be true. He told his disciples that he would die and his spirit would go to heaven. And he would prepare a place for them, and not only for them, but for all who would believe through their testimony. That's the power of the kingdom. It's the power of personal testimony. Today I want us to think about our own personal testimony. I want us to think about the people that has touched in our day. And how it is impacting our world today. Does the fact that Jesus lives make any difference in the world around us? I want us to think about that as we look at the events after the resurrection. Turn with me to John chapter 20. And I bring you a message I'm entitled, I3, the power of the kingdom. John chapter 20. Would you stand with me as we are in the reading of God's precious and holy word? And I hope today that this message, as we look at the faith of people who have lived before us, and the testimonies that they've had, I hope that it will be a blessing to us. John chapter 20, beginning with verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, and we read this last week, but I want to go ahead and read it again, because there's no greater story. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple, and they were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And Peter stooping down, or John stooping down, looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there, 
yet he did not go in. And then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloth lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and he believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise from the dead. And then the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stood down and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one on the head and the other on the feet where the body of Jesus had laid. And then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, my teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, talk about his disciples, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Well, then the same day of evening, being the first day of the week, what is the first day of the week? Sunday. It was the resurrection day, that evening, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled. For fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Now that's a Hebrew word. Shalom. Say that Shalom. And that's the way they greeted one another. So it means when we say hello to you, we say hi. Yeah. But when the Jews said it to one another, they would say peace to you. Shalom. Say that to me. Shalom. And Jesus said to them, Shalom. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples were glad when they what? Saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Shalom, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and he said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Let's stop and pray for that. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Today, Lord, we thank you that we have the Holy Spirit living in our hearts. We know the power of our risen Savior because that power is in us. Lord, it's my desire that every one of us, Lord, would go into our world this week and that we would practice I-3, the Great Commission. And Lord, that we would go and we would invite people to come and hear the message of Jesus, to come to our Sunday school class, to bring their family to Awana and Wednesday night prayer, uh, Bible study and prayer service, to get their children involved in Awana in youth and in all the things that we have to invest in each other so that we might help each other grow in our faith. That we might challenge each other to go out and invite others. Lord, it starts with that invitation. I pray that we will invite. And that's exactly what you told those disciples to do. Go out and be my disciples in this world. I pray, dear Father, today that the testimony of a changed life would be alive in every one of us. The people who we meet this week will have no question in their minds about who we serve. We serve a risen Savior. He lives in my heart. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Please be seated. What would convince 11 men who had witnessed the horrible crucifixion of their master to leave the confines of a secure house where they were assembled and enter a world that had crucified their Lord. They had walked with Jesus for three years. They had witnessed him do miraculous signs. They had seen his miracles prove that he was more than a man. He was God. They had personally witnessed Jesus calm a raging storm at sea with a spoken word. They had personally witnessed Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead after he had been dead and buried for four days. No human being could do that. 
If a person, if there was a man alive who could raise a person from the dead like that, he would go to the grave site where families stand and mourn and grieve over the passing of a child. He would, if he were so, if any man were so powerful today, he would go into the hospital where cancer-ridden bodies are being destroyed. If any man were so powerful, he would go into the nursing home where Alzheimer's, the nursing homes where Alzheimer's has slowly drained the life out of people's minds and bodies. And he would raise them up. There, was, there are a lot of people today who claim to be powerful or influential, but there is only one who has the power of the Lord Jesus, and that's the Lord Jesus himself. Only one. No one else can match his power. And he proved it through his victorious resurrection. It was the resurrection that changed the fear of these disciples into faith and sent them out with a message that changed their world. It was important that they leave that room, that locked room. If they had never left the locked room, you and I would not be sitting here with faith in the Lord Jesus today. But the, the appearance of the resurrected Savior is what set them on fire to continue the mission that Jesus had already started. And today, it is their testimony that can change our lives and move us out to live Christ and proclaim Christ to our world. I'm convinced today that if there's anything that's going to change this world, it is the message of Jesus Christ. Our children need to hear the message of Jesus Christ. Amen? Our grandchildren need to hear the message of Jesus Christ. Amen? Our friends and neighbors need to hear the message of Jesus Christ. Amen? That is our message. That is the only message that is going to change lives. And there's a lost and dying world, a dark world, that needs to hear it and see it through those who have a personal relationship, those who have had a personal encounter with Jesus. They need to see real power. You know, you know, real power, real power impresses people. I uh, was down at uh, Caroline Beach the other day with my wife. We, we went down and spent a few hours together and, and had lunch together. And I said, let's just drive up and see the beach. And we went down there. And I got to if you haven't been down there, let me just say that they have done a first-class job. It's amazing. They pour out the old boardwalk. And they have this beautiful board off. It's about 15 feet wide or whatever. It goes all the way down or 20 feet wide. It goes way down all the way along the length there of the beach. And it's got lighted and, and it's got swings and everything. And if you haven't seen it, you ought to go because it's a beautiful, a most, the nicest, nicest place around here now for, for to walk on the beach like this. Walk on that for beautiful. Well, down at one end, they were building a hotel. And uh, there was this machine that was putting in some pilots, you know, digging holes to pour concrete pilots for the new hotel. And this thing had a beam, on, a, a boom on it, it was like 80 feet tall, and it had it marked out. Somebody had painted the every 10 feet. And I watched that thing with a big drill bit on it, and I just stood there. I told Buddy, he said, I just want to look at this for a minute. And I was standing there because, you know, down at the beach you can for a couple of reasons. First of all, that's a long way to drill. I mean, 80 feet deep, that's a long way to put a hole that big. I mean, wells go in like that, but I'm talking about this, I mean, larger, bigger than I could reach. And that thing was turning, and that thing was pouring down, you could watch it drop every 10 feet. That was powerful. I was also watching it because when you go down about five feet, you hit water, and I just wonder what was gonna happen. But, uh, but it goes down, and that thing went down, and that thing drilled a hole, boy, that was powerful. You know, power impresses people. And I'm, I just want to throw something in here. Friends, maybe the reason we're not reaching more people today in the church of Jesus Christ is that the world is not seeing the powerful difference that Jesus has made in our lives. What do you think? And our world needs to see that. I was talking to a fellow the other day, just yesterday, inviting him to come and visit us. At Calvary, and he was talking to me about churches that he had been around to visit, and such as that, and people that he had met, and how he said, you know, I knew I met a guy at one church, and I got to know him. He was a Sunday school teacher. He said he came in my shop, and he started talking, and 
He was just throwing out profanity and even using the Lord's name in vain. And he said, I told the man, he said, we don't have profanity in my shop. I don't allow that here. I said, that's wonderful, my friend. I'm so glad you told him that. And I said, but how could a Sunday school teacher be doing that? Friends, we're in such a powerless world today where people can go to church and then go out and take God's name in vain and live all kind of immoral lives and have no regard for the Holy Savior that we serve today. Friends, it's a shame. We've got to let this world see, see a difference in our lives. We can't talk and look like the world and expect our testimony to reach anybody for the kingdom of God. And I want to tell you, there is so much at stake. So much at stake. There are people dying without Christ. And there's a world that's getting more hostile toward Christ. And it is estimated that if we don't turn it around, I think it's by the year 2050, there will be America is going to be a Muslim nation and not a Christian nation. More Muslims in America than Christians. If we don't turn it around. And the only way we're going to turn it around is to let that power, the power of the risen Christ be seen in us, friends. There is no God but our God. Amen? Where are you out there? There is no God but our God. Amen? And it's time that we let the world see the power of that risen Christ in us. The Muslims are growing and they're worshiping a God that doesn't exist. And we who know the risen Christ and the power of the risen Christ, we sit back silent with our hands folded and content to say nothing. And the world is missing the Savior who can change our lives. These men... These men were assembled in that little room and they were frightened. But when they saw the Lord and they had an encounter with Him, they went out to set the world on fire with the gospel. You see, the power of the kingdom is found in a personal encounter with the risen Christ. When Jesus walked this earth, everywhere He went, He changed lives. There, there is not one person who reached out a hand to Jesus whose life was not changed forever. Jesus was passing through a crowd a woman reached out her hand and touched the hem of his garment because she had this blood disorder. She had this bleeding problem and she touched him, just the bottom of his robe. She said, if I could just touch him, I know I would be made well. And Matthew recorded it. And he said, because Matthew saw it. Matthew said, suddenly a woman who got a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment for she said to herself, if only I may touch his garment, I shall be, be made well. Then Jesus turned around when he saw her and he said, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. Peter walked with Jesus. He saw this happen. He, in Mark 1, he saw Jesus touch a leper and heal him. A leper came to him. Peter told Mark, John Mark. Mark wrote it down. Peter said, Mark, this is what happened. A leper came to Jesus, imploring him, and kneeling said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leper, he left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them, for a proof that you were once unclean, but now you are clean. Friends, the world needs to see that we were once lost and we were gripped with sin and shame and guilt. But Jesus touched us and we are free. Hallelujah. We're set free. We're clean. We're not like that anymore. And the man went out and began to talk freely about us to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town that was out in the desolate places and people were coming to him from everywhere. What did that man do after he had been set clean, made clean? What did he do? What did he do? He went out and told everybody he knew. People came to Jesus. See, the man could have helped him. Jesus had touched him and healed him. No one could do what Jesus did. Not then and not now. This man couldn't contain himself. He was so overjoyed at what Jesus had done for him. For him, he went out and told everybody about Jesus. That man had lived his life with a, 
a rag across his face in isolation because every time he saw a person come to him, he had to shout, unclean, unclean, and people would run away from him. But then he had a personal encounter with Jesus. And Jesus wasn't afraid of that leprosy. And Jesus touched him. When Jesus touched him, the cries of unclean were changed to, I am clean! I've been set free! I've been saved! Jesus saves! Hallelujah! That man, that man met Jesus. Friends, have you met Jesus? What are your cries today? What are you saying to people today when you talk to them? Jesus touches our lives and changes us, turns us around. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18, Paul said, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have, been, have passed away. Behold, all things have become new, and all things are of God who has reconciled to us, to us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. See, the first disciples of Christ took that seriously. The apostle Paul who wrote these verses had been touched by Jesus. He was a disciple hater. He had been personally responsible for the arrest and subsequent murder of many Christians. He was a devout Jew and a staunch keeper of the law. He believed that Jesus was a fake, was a deceiver. He rejected the thought of Jesus. That is, until one day he was riding down the road from Jerusalem to Damascus to hunt down some more of those renegade Christians. When all of a sudden, the blinding glory of God knocked him to the ground and he heard a voice saying, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And Jesus said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Saul got up from that ground with a new mission. He had, the light blinded him. The glory of God blinded him. But those, that blindness came off. Jesus made him see. And he could see and his whole life was changed. His whole life changed direction. He began doing everything he could to reconcile people to Christ. And that's what all these disciples did when they saw the risen Christ. That's what Mary Magdalene did. What did it do when she saw Jesus? It changed her life. And then the disciples had this personal encounter with the risen Savior. Verse 19, that same day and evening, the resurrection day, that Sunday evening, maybe the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be to you. And I want you to look at the emotions. Verse 19. What, were the emo what was the emotion of the disciples? What was it? Look at 19. Fear. They were afraid. Weren't they? And then what did Jesus say to them? Peace. See, when Jesus said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. They were once afraid. Now, what, or what were they after they encountered Jesus? In verse, in, verse, uh, in verse 20. They were glad. Thank you. They were glad. So then, Jesus breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. He said, These disciples were assembled together. Yet they were still the Jewish feast of unleavened bread, but they were not celebrating. They had heard the words of Mary and the testimony of Peter and John that the tomb was in. But they were not sure what it meant. They still felt abandoned and alone. They had lost the, they had lost the feast of Israel. And they had lost the joy and hope that they had when they were with Jesus. They needed something to move them from that room. And all of a sudden, inside that locked room, Jesus just appeared to them and said, Shalom. Message of peace. The shalom Jesus was giving them was not just a customary greeting that day, but it was an end to the fear and pain that had driven them into hiding. Yes, they had seen their master crucified, but yes, they were seeing their master alive again. John said he showed us his hands and his feet, his side, and we knew it was him, and we were glad. Oh, yes. They were more than glad. They were overflowing with joy. I believe there were tears of joy streaming down their faces. What emotion would you have? How would you react? If you saw someone so close to you, horribly murdered, 
And then all of a sudden, that person stood up and appeared to you and they were alive again. More alive than ever. I'm sure there would be all kinds of emotions in us, and there were all kinds of emotions in that room, but, one, but the thing they needed most from their risen Savior was shalom. They needed peace. You see, they were, they were not out in the woods. Jesus had risen from the dead, but their world was as hostile as ever toward Christ. When they stepped out that door, they were going to be surrounded by unbelieving people, some of those who even hated Jesus. So Jesus breathed on them. He wanted them to experience a taste of the Holy Spirit. His presence was going to come back into their lives through the Holy Spirit. He was going to promise, I'm never going to leave you. And He wouldn't because He would come back through His Holy Spirit. And He wanted them to experience a little bit of what they would get on the day of Pentecost. I like what Rodney Whitaker said about these words from Jesus. He said, if peace prepares them to receive Him, they also needed to receive His commission. Over 40 times throughout the gospel, Jesus is said to have been sent by God. Now, that, that will be the characteristic of his disciples also. The Son has a role in sending of the paraclete, the Holy Spirit. And he plays a role in the sending of the disciples. The Son, like the Father, sends. Sends. Mission is at the heart of discipleship. Amen. True discipleship involves mission. That's the Great Commission. That's in I3, inviting others to come to Christ, investing in others to help them know Christ and grow in their faith, and involving others in sharing Christ, invest, invite, involve. That's I3. That's what Jesus would do with his disciples. He was going to send them into a dark world. He had invited them, come follow me, you'll be fishers of men. He invested in them and showed them how to have strong faith. And now he was going to involve them to carry out his mission. His mission and, his, and take his message, the message of a risen Christ. Their sorrow had been turned into gladness because Jesus was standing in their midst. They were re not reunited with him, but they needed to be united with him. You see, Jesus was not going to stick around in bodily form. He told Mary, tell my disciples, I am ascending to my Father and now your Father. And to my God and your God, something new and very important was happening. Jesus was not just going up to prepare a place for us in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was preparing the hearts of his disciples as a place for his as a place for his presence to dwell in them. Once Jesus ascended into heaven, he would send his Holy Spirit to live within his disciples, and that would make them one with Christ. Christ would no longer live his life on earth as he once did. Now he was going to live through his disciples. They needed his spirit. You see, friends, humans by themselves are not capable of living a holy life that obeys God's purposes all the time. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the presence of Jesus living his life through us. Jesus knew that his appearance as a resurrected Savior just his appearance would not be enough to carry those men through what they would face. They needed their Savior with them again. And he would be with them in a more powerful way than ever before through his own personal spirit. So, so Jesus gave them a taste of what they would receive about 40 days later on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit would come and immerse those first believers and send them out with a new power to reach their world. And today we have their testimony. The testimony of men who walked with Jesus, who saw him crucified, who witnessed his death and resurrection, and who were indwelled by his Holy Spirit. And that's what I just want you to look at with me for a moment, a few more The unfailing witness of the apostles. Men who had a personal encounter with Christ, who touched their world. After Jesus rose from the dead, his disciples huddled together, afraid they too might suffer the same fate. They were frightened and rightly so, because they were their, their Savior had been taken away from them, falsely accused, wrongly convicted, brutally murdered before their eyes. They were assembled, not knowing what to do. But the Savior, the same Savior that walked with them, spoke words of life to them and appeared to them after his death. The resurrected Christ, remember this, it was the, the same Christ that they walked with, appeared once more, and they were glad when they saw the Lord. 
You see, the resurrection of Christ not only reassured them of his beauty and power, it energized them to go tell the world that Jesus saves. And it's the same kind of energy we need today in us, in the church today, to go out into a world that has become more and more anti-Christ. The disciples left that room with a new hope and a renewed mission that would take them around their world to touch the lives of millions of people throughout history through their writings and their testimony. It is their testimony that we read today in this New Testament. And they gave their lives that we might have. So what happened to them when they left that room? History gives us some insight. I want to share a couple things with you today about that. In his third commentary on Genesis, Origen of Alexandria that lived 185 to 254 AD wrote that the apostles divided up the work of evangelizing the world between them. Peter, for example, took Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Bithynia, and at the last came to Rome and was crucified. Because, and according to Origen, other apostles went elsewhere. Thomas was assigned in what is today India, and John was given Asia. Well, the first that we see as we look at these apostles is James. Now, when, when Jesus called the brothers, James and John were fishing with their fathers in the Sea of Galilee. They immediately left their father and their business to follow this new rabbi, Jesus. James was probably the older of the two brothers because he was always mentioned first. After Christ's ascension, James remained in Jerusalem. And when he, together with the other apostles, received the Holy Spirit, he preached the gospel in Judea and Samaria. Acts 1, 13 and 14 tells us a, a little bit about that. And then he went to Spain, but meeting with little success, he returned to Judea. And at that time, the Roman emperor Claudius ordered Herod Agrippa I to suppress the church of Christ. So Herod arrested James on the day, on the feast of the Passover, and put him in prison. Shortly afterwards, he was sentenced to death and executed with a sword in Jerusalem. That occurred 40, the year 45 after the birth of Christ. Now, according to the Roman historian Eusebius and Clement of Alexandria, who lived in the second and third centuries, long time ago, James' executioner was so moved by James' testimony that he professed himself to be a Christian and was led to death with James. And as they were led out, the executioner asked James to forgive him and both were beheaded in about 44 AD. Then we see Peter. Peter was another one in that room. Peter, often a spokesman for the twelve, stands out in the Gospels. Whenever the men are listed, Peter usually came first. He, James, and John formed that inner circle of disciples. They alone were given the unique privilege of experiencing the transfiguration of Jesus. After the resurrection of Christ, Peter became a bold evangelist and missionary. Remember, he had denied the Lord the night he was being tried. He became the, he left that place of denial. He became the strong, one of the strongest of the leaders of the early church, perhaps the strongest. And on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached the first gospel message and more than 3,000 people were saved. After Herod Agrippa first killed James and he saw it please the Jews, he arrested Peter and intended to put him to death. But the, while the church prayed, an angel of the Lord released Peter from prison and he went back to his fellow disciples. Later, Peter did travel to Rome and he led many to faith in Christ. While he was there, the emperor Nero had him arrested and placed him in the Mamertine prison. The Mamertine prison was a dingy complex of cells consisting of two levels, one on top of the other. The lower cell could only be reached through a hole in its roof and was purportedly where the Romans imprisoned their most formidable enemies. Some prisoners starved to death there and their bodies were tossed into the city's main sewer. Both Peter and Paul are said to have been jailed in that prison by Nero and that while, while they were there, many of the prisoners and guards accepted Christ. One story from tradition says that the two apostles caused an underground spring to miraculously rise up from the ground so they could baptize their guards and their fellow prisoners. Peter was sentenced by the emperor Nero to be crucified. 
But esteeming himself unworthy to be crucified with his head upward like his Savior, he requested to be crucified with his head downward, which he easily obtained because his enemies were glad, willingly, willing for him to have more pain in his crucifixion. Eusebius wrote that Peter died after the preaching, after preaching the gospel for 37 years and when he was 70 years old. Then there was Andrew. Andrew, whose name means manly, was the first apostle of Jesus Christ. The younger brother, Simon Peter, born in Bethsaida on the Sea of Galilee. He had been the follower of John the Baptist. But when John proclaimed that Jesus the Lamb of God, Andrew went with Jesus and spent a day with him. Andrew quickly found his brother, Simon Peter, and told him, We found the Messiah and brought, Peter, brought Simon Peter to meet Jesus. The brothers were fishermen by, by trade. Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. After his crucifixion and resurrection of, of Jesus, Andrew preached the gospel in Asia Minor and Scythia as far as Kiev. Andrew was martyred by crucifixion at Petros in, in Achaia in Greece. Because Saint Andrew, because Andrew deemed himself unworthy to be crucified on the same type of cross which Christ had been crucified, he asked his captors to tie him to an X-shaped cross. And it's said that Andrew did not die right away, but he lived three days on that cross all the while, while praising God and preaching the gospel. Then there was Philip in that room that day. Philip the Apostle was one of the earliest followers of Jesus Christ. Some scholars speculate Philip, Philip was first a disciple of John the Baptist because he lived in that region where John preached. Like Peter and Andrew, Philip was a Galilean from the village of Bethsaida. They were probably friends. They probably knew each other. Jesus said to Philip, follow me, and he did. Leaving his old life behind, Philip answered the call and recruited the skeptical Nathaniel. We also see him called Bartholomew. And the, the last we hear of, of Philip, the apostle, is in the book of Acts. At Philip's ascension, at Jesus' ascension, and the day of Pentecost. But history tells us that Philip preached in Phrygia, Asia Minor, Heropolis, and there... In Heropolis, the Ebionites, who owned, not only divide, denied the divinity of Christ, but also worshipped idols, would not listen to Philip, but caught, uh, captured him and having tied his head to a pillar, stoned him to death. And there was Nathaniel in that room that day when Jesus appeared. Most Bible scholars believe Nathaniel and Bartholomew were the same person. And I do too. That name Bartholomew is a family designation. It just means son of Toma. But Nathaniel means gift of God. John described, describes Nathaniel's call by Philip. The two may have been friends because Nathaniel was stopping Nazareth. Philip said, come and see this, see this man who be the Messiah. And Nathaniel stopped. Could anything good come from, from Nazareth? And see the two men approach Jesus called Nathaniel, a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false, no guile. Church tradition said Nathaniel carried a translation of Matthew's gospel to northern India, and tradition says that he was crucified upside down in Albania. Matthew was named Levi before his call by Jesus. He was a Roman tax collector from Capernaum. Matthew displayed one of the most radically changed lives in the Bible. Jesus called him. He did not hesitate. He did not look back. He left his wealth and security and he followed Jesus. The remainder of Matthew's life is a little uncertain, but tradition says he preached for 15 years in Jerusalem following the death and resurrection of Jesus. Then he went out on the mission field to other countries. Eusebius wrote that when Matthew was sent out to teach among the heathen, Ethiopia fell to him. But before he left Judea, he, through the illumination, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote the Gospel of Matthew in the Hebrew language. History states that immediately after the death of King Aglippus, who was attached to the Christians, who liked the Christians, his successor, Hydecus, an unbelieving heathen, persecuted Matthew, and at a certain time when Matthew was teaching in the church of God, he caused him to be apprehended and nailed him to the ground and beheaded. Then there was Thomas. Thomas, surnamed Didymus, that means twin, was a native of Galilee. He probably was a fisherman. 
It's Thomas who had an important part in the resurrection. Look with me in verse 24 of our text. Now Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve was not with him when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them, and Jesus came. The doors being shut, and he, Jesus stood in the middle and said, Shalom. And then he said to Thomas, Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands, and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. See, Thomas had not been present when Jesus first appeared. All he had was the testimony of those other disciples. But that is important because, friends, that's all we have. The testimony of other disciples before us. We have never seen the resurrected Lord. We can tell the world, though, what the Bible says. Because it is the Word of God that changes lives. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God and the salvation to everyone who believes. There is power in believing the Word of God. And Thomas did believe. After he saw the risen Christ and believed, he traveled through Parthia, Ethiopia, and India, preaching the gospel and leading many to faith. Concerning the end of Thomas, the most probable account found by the ancient writers is this, that at Kalamina, a city in the East Indies, he put a stop to the abominable, abominable idolatry of the heathen who worshipped an image of the sun so that through the power of God he compelled, he compelled them to destroy the image. And so therefore the, the priest of that cult occur, occur, accused uh, Thomas before them, before their king, who sentenced him first to be tormented with red hot plates and then cast into a glow, glowing furnace and burned. But when the idolatrous priest who stood before the furnace saw that the fire didn't hurt him, they pierced his side as he lay in the furnace with spears and javelins as he confessed Christ was dead. And then finally today, John. John the Apostle had the distinction of being a beloved friend of Jesus Christ. He was called the disciple whom Jesus loved. John and his brother James, the other, another disciple of Jesus, of course, were fishermen on the Sea of Galilee with their father Zebedee. They were part of that inner circle of disciples. On one occasion, when a Samaritan village rejected Jesus, James and John asked if they should call down fire upon the place and destroy, and destroy them. But of course, Jesus said, don't do that. You don't know what you're asking. John, it was John who had a prior relationship with with Joseph Caiaphas, and that allowed him to go into the courtyard to see what was happening the night of Jesus' trial and crucifixion. John served, stayed in Jerusalem, and served the church for many years, and then he moved on to work in the church at Ephesus. One legend holds that John was taken to Rome during the persecution and thrown into boiling oil, but emerged unhurt. Another is that he was forced to drink poison, but survived. But we do know from Scripture that he was banished by Emperor Domitian about 97 AD, who in his wrath and displeasure, because he preached the word of, of, of God and confessed Jesus to be the Son of God, he had him sentenced and banished to the Isle of Patmos. And it was on that island in the Mediterranean Sea, 125 miles northwest of Jerusalem, that John received that marvelous re revelation of Jesus, of Jesus Christ. And after his release, release, John returned to Ephesus, where tradition tells us that he stayed in that church, teaching the message of Jesus until he was almost 100, 100 years old, and writing this book that we have called John in the New Testament, and the first three, and, and the three letters that he wrote. Just think of how powerful this is. In our hands, we hold a Bible that was given to us from the very people that believed, that saw the resurrected Christ and went out to, to tell their world the message of Jesus. You know, we're not getting a second-hand account from John. John was one of Jesus' closest disciples. He knew Jesus better than anybody at that time. He was with Jesus almost everywhere he went. 
I know that the Gospel of John was not written while he walked with Jesus. He wrote it later on in his life. And he probably had someone write it for him. But John said the words, and we have them right here. Friends, John gives us a clear picture of Jesus. It was John who said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh, and we beheld His glory. It was John who said, For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It was John who said, who wrote the words of Jesus, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives His life for the sheep, and my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life. It was John who heard Jesus say, I, if you, I, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And it was John who said in verse 30, Truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. Friends, all these disciples suffered, suffered, because they believed in the risen Savior. There is a world around us that needs Jesus. And we are the only witnesses that are in this world today. John was dead. These disciples have died. But we hold their personal testimony in our hands. What will we do with them? You and I who have had a personal encounter with Jesus, we have a peace that this world doesn't understand. But it can understand it and receive it. Receive that peace if we will share it and they will believe it. I really do believe we're the only hope for this whole world now. The masses of lost people are not going to turn to Jesus because the media or the government leads them to do so. I wish they would, but that's not going to happen. They will only turn to Jesus if the disciples of Christ, those who have had a personal encounter with Christ, give them, show them some reason to believe. I read this little story. Not long after we moved into our first house in California, my wife, Janie, and I picked up on the tension between a couple of neighbors. One was a very outspoken church door, while the other was an unbeliever. I knew I was in the hot seat when the unchurched man struck up a conversation with me as we were both working in our yards. Say, Steve, aren't you a pastor? Seems implicit in, this, in the public's understanding that pastors exist to serve as referees in times of conflict. So I reluctantly listened as this troubled man opened up about his neighbor that he had never understood. He unfolded a long history of numerous conflicts over small issues, and then he looked up and he sighed, but the most recent problem takes the cake, Pastor. We received a letter from his attorney threatening to sue us if we don't trim a tree that borders his yard. It seems strange he didn't just come over and ask me to take care of the tree before he went to his attorney. With a little wink in his in this streetwise unchurched man, he continued, You know, I was getting ready to trim that tree, but now there's no way I'm going to do anything until he forces me. I would gladly go to court just so I could have a story to tell about being sued by Christians over an orange tree. He summarized his thoughts with a haunting observation. I guess sometimes Christians love us and just don't like us. Friends, the world around us, listen, your world, is in desperate need of Jesus. He needs, to some, he needs to see something better than this testimony. He needs to see something real and powerful. And there's nothing more powerful than letting them see Jesus in you. Amen? So my question is, what, is, what difference is your life for Christ making in the life of those around you? Let's stand. Showed you. Isn't it amazing how they suffered 
for their testimony. You and I are not suffering a lot for our testimony, but are we willing to? Are we willing to be a Christian even when the crowd around us is doing other things, ungodly things? Are we willing to stand alone if we have to? That's what I'm wondering today. How strong is our testimony and our faith? Maybe today you need that faith. You need to start a relationship with Jesus. He loves you and died for you. You can pray and receive Him. Pray and say, Dear Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe you rose from me. I ask you to forgive me for my sins. I ask you to come into my heart and be my Savior forever. Right now, Jesus, I accept you into my life as my only Savior. And I want to follow you all my life, all the way to heaven. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. You prayed that prayer. There's nothing more important than that. Even while you go out today, there's some books on our welcome center. Someone will be glad to give you if you just ask them. It will help you grow in your faith. I want you to grow and stay in church and serve the Lord and learn. The Word is powerful and it's meat for your spirit. It helps you grow. Your, your family needs it. The people around you need it. And be strong in your testimony. And if you're here today and there's someone in your life that you need to reach, would you even pray right now with me? Father, please, be seen in me. Please, strengthen my faith. Strengthen my testimony so that I can reach this person that I love, these people that I know. Please help me. Help people see the power of Jesus in my life. Thank you for being my victorious Savior. I can help you in any way if I can pray for you or Talk to you about joining the church. You can check a card for me and hand it to me going out or come down to the front while we sing. Brother Steve, 